All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yolanda Trotman, and welcome to the conversation where we just talk about it. Now, if you haven't done so already, make sure that you go to the Facebook page and make sure that you like us at The Conversation with Yolanda Trotman. If you haven't done so already, make sure you go to the Instagram page, The Conversation underscore pod show. Make sure that you are following us there. Obviously, this is a very important and very near and dear to, um, near and dear to me topic. And um, when coming up with the topic for this particular show, I mean, the person who is our guest tonight was a no-brainer. And so what I wanted to talk about tonight and the conversation be centered around is art, art and the black experience, what, really, what, what art really is at its core, what it means to, um, to us as African Americans in terms of making sure that we tell our story in ways that make sense. And then, of course, making sure that we are always mindful of how art is evolving in terms of not only how we tell our story, but how our story is perceived. And when I was doing more, addition, more and additional research, what I found was that not even just the art itself, but the lives of the artists and what they had to actually go through in order to tell our story is absolutely fascinating. I know for me, I didn't really become interested in art as far as starting to collect it until I was in college. And all of the themes were very much historical for me. Um, I was a history major, so all of my themes are very Afrocentric. And that's what I started to collect. They were very, very basic prints, but then it evolved from there to starting to look at contemporary art. So our guest here tonight, I'm so excited about, mm -hmm. came all the way from South Carolina. And if you don't know who he is, you will absolutely positively know who he is because he absolutely will be a household name. And his story is fascinating. The fact that he's taken a tremendous leap of faith and he is now a full-time artist is incredible. Um, we met about four years ago, three or four years ago at an event, I think a 100 Black Men event, I feel like. Maybe yeah. that's where it was. Um, we exchanged information and about three or four, almost three years to the day later, um, mm -hmm. you reached out. Um, came to Charlotte, started off with you just giving me one of your pieces, and then I said, you know, I really want to have something commissioned, something that's near and dear, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I am so excited, everyone, so sit back, relax, because at the end, we're going to do a whole art lesson, because I fancy myself to be a little baby artist, but we're going to see about that. <laughs> but um, what we want to all in terms of art, of course, the symbol of because as I said, he will be a household name. So welcome to the conversation, y'all. Let's talk about it. So the black experience, mm -hmm. Tariq, when you think about art, just in general, why does it matter? Um, art really matters because it's uh, a time in history. It's always going to be a time in history. It's going to be a part of our culture. Um, just as a whole, uh, and uh, as a universal sense, um, art, we as artists are going to, we're poet, poets in a sense, so we actually paint the picture, you know, and I take it to a little bit of a deeper uh, sense. If we didn't have art, then you wouldn't have different languages. How so? That's fascinating. So what I mean by that is everything as far as uh, like writing, fonts, um, the color of a rapper uh, raps his lyrics, he's telling a story. Mm -hmm. um, everybody tells a story in whatever art that they do and so what is your medium what is it that you tend to use as far as when you create well my medium is uh acrylics so i use a lot of i like to build up a lot of texture mm -hmm. um and, and play with uh different you know uh scenarios on canvas and things of that nature so i could push acrylics and it dries faster mm -hmm. so um i just like to push acrylics to um to the edge and uh, really think out of the box. Um, always trying to uh, take my skill to the next level in some type of way. Simply put, why should we as black people care about art? We have to, man. We have to. Uh, I think that um, looking at in history, you know, I went to Howard University. So uh, we, when we studied black art, we studied some of the greats. And um, looking back in history... Uh, some of the masters then caught some of the times that we went through. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a way for us to breathe. So, you know. Uh, oh, that's good. What do you mean by that? Well, 
you know, some of the pieces that I do, um, and, you know, when artists do pieces, they actually, um, it has meaning. So, again, with it telling that story, um, you can make you can make the story that you want to make. Mm -hmm. So, uh, some of the pieces that I have, they're like, they have a cause behind it. So, I've had many of my collectors come up and see my piece, mm -hmm. and they break down in tears. Because it has a story that represents them. It, it has a story that says strive on it has a story that that motivates them to continue to be who they are and to continue to uh strive for the best mm -hmm. so when you look at some of those masters pieces and uh like during the great migration and things of that nature mm -hmm. um they even now when i look at them i mean i can look at them for days and still love them right because you can see the history you can actually without even looking at a photograph you can see uh, some of the things that represented us as a strong people mm -hmm. uh, during those times. Right. Um, so it gives you strength. It just gives you a, it gives you strength. It gives you courage. Um, it's just like looking at a photo in a, in another sense in another moment mm -hmm. moment in time. So. Excellent. So I'm going. I want to talk a little bit about some of the iconic artists, mm -hmm. um, the artists who paved the way. Hopefully, some of them are ones that have kind of inspired you on yeah. your journey. Um, the first one is Henry Tanner, mm -hmm. and um, very few people know about him. Um, even taking an art class, he's not one that's that's taught, but should be. Mm -hmm. um, when I was doing my research, I did not know that he was the first. Um, black artist that was internationally recognized. Mm -hmm. Born before the Civil War, he was born in um, 1859, lived to be 77. Mm -hmm. um, he did a lot of his work in the Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area. But what is really fascinating about him is that when he came to Pennsylvania, he was the only black student in his class, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, his teacher um, took a liking to him and really started to encourage his work. And so he he does a series of paintings about the, the story of the artist's life, but can you imagine you're now a teenager, post-war, po or antebellum U.S., yeah. this is now post-Civil War Reconstruction, and while it is a time historically where African Americans are making big strides in terms of politics and mm -hmm. all of that, of, of course, before Jim Crow um, ascends on the U.S., but he ends up as a result of that moving to Paris. Yeah, yeah. And you find that story a lot with a lot of artists who can't and aren't accepted here in the States mm -hmm. and they end up having to go to Europe or they end up either Europe by, by choice or because they have to. So a lot of his work um, has French influences, French landscape, things of that nature, and he's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, what I think is telling when I was doing the research, I didn't find a lot of women until that were at least recognized mm -hmm. at least until um either the tail end of the harlem renaissance or more specifically in the 1970s mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that um and i'm putting you on the spot, <laughs> 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 the spot, spot. you know again i could tell another story with my art when we get to that part but i just think that um you know and, and we always are working to make it even for um our beautiful women. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that it's just always been in that working force, and especially back then, right. um, that men were always highlighted as um, the active uh, duty persons. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think back in that day, women were more looked on as uh, ser the servant type, you know, you know, sad to say now, right. you know, Let's these days is a little bit better, you know. Yeah. Uh, For the most part, yeah. Black girl magic you is know, a very real thing. Though. When we when we wise up and uh and um, take heed to it, but I think just back then it it was just an overall mentality cause that the man was always on the in the mm -hmm. forefront, mm -hmm. and uh, women were more in the shadows, you know. And what I found is that even with Henry being as acclaimed as he was, when he had shows, it had to be shows obviously backed by white folks. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, there was one thing that I read about in his autobiography, like his first major show, he didn't come out at all because mm -hmm. he didn't want he didn't want 
the show to not be successful mm -hmm. because they found out if they would have found out that he was black. Yeah, yeah. And that is very telling because you're still talking about the late 1800s, getting closer to the turn of the century, and there were some um, ebbs and flows. But a lot of people don't know how Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania really shaped the landscape. I mean, we all think about New York, we think about Harlem, we think about the Harlem Renaissance, but yeah. Pennsylvania, particularly Philly and Pittsburgh, had really strong influences. Yeah. Um, that most people don't know about, but we'll get to that. Um, the other person I thought about was Jacob Lawrence. Anything come to mind with him? My work. <laughs> oh, yeah? How so? Um, he's one of the ones that I love and that I was influ influenced by because um, he pretty much, um, was, he told a story mm -hmm. of the Great Migration, and um, he did it in a simple form. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that I love about it. Uh, you know, there was a period where there was realism and everything that realism was accepted, you know, back like way back in Michelangelo days and stuff like that, where all that stuff was, was great. But then you have people that, again, like me, I like to step outside of the box. Right. But his work was still so compelling and strong by just the simple nature with shape, lines, and, and color. Okay. Uh, one of the things that um, I loved about that too was, you know, in, in college I was a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. I actually started out in architect, really? architecture. So um, that that was a uh, short lived though <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> why is that? <laughs> um, I was on football. Well, I was trying to go out for the football team mm -hmm. at the time, and um, basically as an uh, architect major, if um, a lot of you know out there who may be architect majors, um, we would stay overnight mm -hmm. in the classroom drawing four-hour drawings, five-hour drawings. And then on top of that, uh, when you're playing football in college, you have, like, uh, film to look at. That's outside of practice. So right. it's um, you, you have to do a lot. So I had to give up architecture um, to... Um, and kind of see where I wanted to go from there. Right. But, you know, God willing, it worked out to be mm -hmm. uh, where I am now. Um, but, yeah, that was uh, that that particular um, road was uh, good because mm -hmm. it got me to where I am today. So. And so would you think, would you consider Jacob Lawrence's work to be a major influence for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, we look at some of my works. Um, I keep it simple. It's more abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, some some of them don't have faces. Mm -hmm. But overall, the whole composition of the piece comes together to tell a story. What do you so. want people to know about him? Jacob Lawrence? Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, you you gotta, you gotta just got to go look, look him up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was looking at some stuff on him the other day and just... Um, in the in the era that he was in with the Harlem Renaissance and um, being in that cultural right. uh, atmosphere, which we're trying to get back to today mm -hmm. as a whole, mm -hmm. and I think because of that period and, and that time, um, there were some creatives that pretty much uh, grasped him by the hand mm -hmm. and and um, inspired him to continue to create the way he did. Gotcha. And he was a kid at the time mm -hmm. uh, when he started you know, um, doing his drawings and stuff. And some of the um, professors and stuff was buying his work for like 5 and $10, which back then, wow. you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> back then it was a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, you know, he had his first studio. He got a grant, and his rent was $8 a month. Mm. So you can only imagine if he was selling his work for 5 and $10. Right. I mean, you know, let's say well, I got a studio now in Charlotte, downtown Charlotte. I'm probably looking at a thousand dollars, maybe more. Oh, uh, my de depends on Much you know. More than that. So, yeah. I mean, if you look at the comparison from five to ten dollars for his work mm -hmm. to his eight dollar rent, right. like he was doing it big back then. Mm -hmm. But he was doing what he loved, right? You know, and and you know, he was kind of discussing how he, in a sense, loved that. Uh, his collect when his collectors bought his work, mm -hmm. it added value to what he was doing. Right. You know, which we always talk about support in the black community right. and um, and and artwork, which that that is like every artist like you say, hey, mm -hmm. how much is that piece? Mm -hmm. And they say, and I and I may say, you know, a 
thousand dollars. A thousand dollars, you know. <laughs> right. But you know, it was just all in support and mm -hmm. and having them continue to do. But now, look, I mean, if you have a Jacob Lawrence in your collection, mm -hmm. man, right. it's thousands of dollars where they was paid paying five and ten dollars mm -hmm. back then. So. Next up, Romare Bearden. Oh yeah. Talk to me about him. Romare Bearden. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and put him as my top, my number one. Um, Romir Bearden. Um, he was. He's. He's African American, and a lot of people, uh, in a sense, I was uh, actually looking at some information on him, mm -hmm. and uh, I. I'm in a sense just like he was. How so? He played sports, mm -hmm. and he was uh, in baseball. Uh, had a dream to go, and actually he was offered to pay, play in the major leagues. Right. Born right here in Charlotte. Born in Charlotte, mm -hmm. yep. And uh, when he was uh, asked to play in the major league, the only, there was something that um, that stopped him from doing that, mm -hmm. doing so, because they told him, hey, if you pay, play in the major league, you, you just have to be known as, as being white. Right. He was a very, he was a fair-skinned. Mm -hmm. um, he could have passed, and yeah. in some cases he did. So he he felt the need to you know I'm not doing that. Right. You know, he could have made all this money mm -hmm. but he uh turned that down. Mm -hmm. And um he basically um again the African American community em embraced him. He had some uh, mentors and they continued to uh push him to do his artwork. Mm -hmm. And he just poured all his love into that. Uh, he poured all his motivation, all his heart, all his soul, and his sole purpose, if you look at his works, mm -hmm. was to tell the, that story. That's right. And um, the the struggle and, you know, the strength in the black community. And he did that in, in many layers, many dimensions. Oh, yeah. It wasn't oh, just, yeah. you know, acrylic or oh, you yeah. know, one particular piece. Yeah. There's, there's lots of texture. Yeah. And you feel something. Yeah. And, you know, I... I am guilty of that too. Like I didn't know, know I didn't know much about him until I found out about the naming of the park. Yeah. And then started to do some research. It's like wow, that's fascinating. Especially the fact that um, the fact that he he did turn down an opportunity to be very 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 wealthy. Yeah, yeah. But his legacy lives on in his art. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Kara Walker. Oops. Kara Walker. She is when I first saw. Uh, Carol Walker's work, it, it had a shock value to it. Okay. Yeah. So. What do you want them to know about Kara? Kara, she pretty much, um, again, when you get deep into telling a story with art, you want to get, it's more political. Right. Hers is more political. And the silhouettes definitely, even though they're right. silhouettes, they're very powerful. Right. Very and powerful. Um, I'm trying to. Uh, think of this one piece that she had, but I think it was made out of, uh, ooh, forgive me, but this piece was huge. It was probably like, mm -hmm. it was like, it out of, um, she, was, um, she made it out of some type of material, mm -hmm. but the material that she made it, made it out of mm -hmm. was in reference to the black woman. Mm -hmm. But it th again, it had shock value, mm -hmm. so it really brought across the message. Right. So it's like I'm gonna tell you this message. You can you can either say, "Yeah, I'm gonna tell you this message," or you can right. say, "I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you this message." Now, now you getting ready to hear? I said what I said. Yeah, now. this is it. <laughs> like if you don't know, now you know. Yeah, she's definitely one you want to you want to Google her. You want to take a look at her work. All of them are very important. Yeah. But I, I wanted to make sure there was a woman in the mix. Oh that yeah, oh, had yeah. A, a very profound and powerful story. Last up, Jean Michel Basquiat. Oh man, I just like saying his name. Icon. Jean Michel yes, Basquiat. Basquiat died way too soon. Yeah. Um, at twenty seven, heroin overdose. Mm -hmm. Um, very well. Um, I'll let you tell it. Well, I mean, Basquiat, again, he came up in an era when, um, man, powerful. We have, we got some powerful people. We do. We got some powerful people. Uh, Basquiat came up in that era when um, the, the business of art in mm -hmm. New York was uh, starting to really flourish mm -hmm. or was flourishing at the top. So basically, you know, uh, artists would do their work. 
you know, they would go to the gallery, mm-hmm. have a show. They may have had someone that, uh, you know, backed them, mm-hmm. you know, as an investor. Um, and then people bought their work. Right. And then they went back to the studio, and then they did it again, and then the cycle continued. Right. Um, it's a little bit harder these days sometimes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, some artists, they have a full time, and then they uh, steal some time in the wee hours of the morning yeah. to uh, do their work. Mm-hmm. But um, he was with the icons of uh, Warhol, some yeah. of the pop icons mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, and actually, uh, he has the American record, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Well, I think it's 105 million. His piece, which is untitled, mm-hmm. um, sold to a Japanese collector for, wait for it, people, 101.5 million yeah. dollars. I'm just waiting for that collector, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, and it started at like 60 million. And yeah. he painted in like 87, 88, yeah. something, something, 101.5 yeah. million dollars. So clearly this gentleman was a billionaire. Right. You got 101 million right. to just say, yo, <laughs> this is mine. I'm going home with it. Yeah. I had to put it up though, because they're like, what is worth 101 million? And it beat Andy Warhol's record. Right. That's why it was such a big deal. You didn't really hear about it in the news, maybe a blip here and there, but that's so important because right. Andy Warhol, when you think about, you know, at least acceptable mainstream iconic, uh, iconic artists, yeah. he's the one with the, you know, um, the images of celebrities and all mm-hmm. of that, of course, Marilyn Monroe's being a big one. But this was the piece. Oh, yeah. $101 million, a skull, and it's not even a huge piece. Like, it's a, it's a large piece, but yeah. it really talked about the experience for yeah. us in America. Yeah. You know, with the colors and the shading. I don't know. Maybe that's not what it was because it, it never had a title. But when I first saw it, it was like I see anger. I see um, I see so much emotion. I love the fact that it's abstract. Right. Um, the eyes are so prominent. You know, it's almost, is it is it tears? Like, what is it that you're seeing as far as that experience? But it's a skull. Yeah. So you don't know if it's a male skull or a female skull. You know, but I just thought that that's, incredible but but one thing i would like to point out about mm-hmm. this is people ask me so many times they're like oh your work is so beautiful i wish i can be an artist mm-hmm. you never know what's what right you know and people yes people buy the artwork mm-hmm. but again they buy the story the meaning and they buy the artist right you know um so any artists out there i always encourage you hey continue to do what you're doing right it's not about making money you know, at the end of the day, we would all love as artists to sell a piece for five thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand dollars. But do what you love, right. you know. And I always tell people, whatever your art is and whatever your talent is, do what you love. The money will come later. And we hear it all the time. It's so simple, simply said. Do what you love, and the money will come later. Mm-hmm. But obviously, he did what he loved. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a portrait of anybody that sold for one hundred five million dollars. Right. Right. You know, it was just a collector came along. They loved it. It spoke to him, mm-hmm. and he wrote the check. And he yeah. and he never even put a title to it. Right. You know, and you know he had so much support. And of course, unfortunately, with a lot of artists, you know, po- once they pass on, then of course the work becomes more valuable. But this is incredible. It's right. an incredible piece. I want to shift gears because I picked out three pieces that I thought were iconic, but for different reasons. Okay. Um, more so because I think it pushed art to the forefront mm-hmm. for most black folk to really look at art differently. Yeah. What do you think the first one is? I, obviously, you don't know, but Man, you want to take a guess? Thousands of pieces Okay, I'm going right to give you a hint. 1970s. Not really a hint. Just roll with it. TV show. Oh, uh. Come on, come on, Tariq. You got it. You got it. Uh, good, um, good times. Okay. Good times. Um, I'm going to get a whooping after this show. You is are over. probably. <laughs> <laughs> Wait oh, for long it. night, long Wait night. Wait for it. You ready? Is, uh, you mean push, push the button? I know. Good times. Uh, that everybody thought J.J. did it. No, he didn't. He didn't It was it. not J.J. Um, but. Not really, not really. Yep. Yeah, close. Gives us an E. Go ahead and give it to me. All right. The Sugar Shack. Right. 
by Bur Ernie, uh, Banks. Ernie Banks. Yes, and this is not the original. This is what everybody remembers at the end of Good Time, but this is actually the album cover for whose album? Except you don't know that because you're young. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, it was an original it? album cover. There's some, some subtle differences. Guess. No, I can't do it. Mm. Marvin, no. Yes, Marvin Gaye? you got it. Yeah. Yeah, it says Marvin Gaye. Oh, okay, I ain't see that part. <laughs> I ain't see that part. <laughs> so that's how he changed it, and then he added um, WSRC, which is a radio station in Durham. Yeah. So he did. He made some some subtle changes, that's, but this is the actual album cover for "I Want You." That's my hometown. Yeah. Durham. Oh, I know, Bull City, Durham. Bull yeah. City. Okay. But what was so? What was? Everybody saw this at the end of every mm -hmm. episode. And so when people started to think, and of course, you know, J.J. being an artist and all of that, what I think is particularly, I mean, as a kid, I didn't get it. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But then you, when you actually look at it as an adult and it, in the elongated moves and how it shows movement and joy and inhi inhibition, no inhibitions and things of that nature, um, everybody wants to find. Everybody wants a place that's like the sugar shack. Yeah. Like, where's your spot? Well, we What's still, your we still spot? have them these days. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, just, it's, mm. it's the uh, the juke joints with the chicken wings it, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and Hennessy. That's right, chicken wings. Little it's Hennessy, the hole in the wall. The, yeah, yeah, we got some of those <laughs> in every city, including Charlotte. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the spot where you can be yourself. Oh yeah. And you know, the music's good. Chicken. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the chicken wings are good. If you don't have oh, good chicken, chicken wings, wings, always gonna be good. In not the always. I had a bad experience. Won't call them out, okay. but whatever, it happens. <laughs> um, but what about this piece speaks to you? Again, it's the, it's the black it's the black experience. Mm -hmm. um, they're having a good time. It, it, Except you, this guy. It's you know, not he's like, why is he like? Now this? this is the guy that. <laughs> <laughs> that he he doesn't dance much at all. He's but, just, but he looking at all. He of looks this. like he's sleep to read. Look, his eyes are closed. You know why he's sleep? He, he just he had see. Look at yeah. that. That's why you see that right oh, there. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't hit that yak. It tell the story. Yeah, See right here. Oh, okay. I knew that. See right here. He slumped okay, over. Okay. Uh huh. It was the yak. All right. <laughs> so it's, it's telling the story. I mean, I love this piece. I have some pieces uh that. That tell the story of you know black folks having a good time. Mm -hmm. You know whether they're whining and dining or you know we just we just got everything. Yeah. Rhythm, color, everything. Color in our moves. Color in our dance. Oh, that's beautiful. Say that yeah, again. Yeah. Everything. So. Um, color in our moves. That's deep. Yeah. That's deep. You know the way the way we step. Everything. You know the way we dance. You know and it's everything is iconic. I just hope our people. You know dig deep and know that right like you know once you're good with who you are and and that's why we always look at acceptance mm -hmm. you know because the world looks at that and um you know a lot a lot of what we do is you know on a higher level right. is loved mm -hmm. you know but then sometimes it's like but why aren't we loved right you know we're uh, mimicked and, and we're imitated everything about yeah. us is imitated but. And, and I think that you know we have so much tension these days you know what I mean um, there are some people that are, are trying to bridge the gap mm -hmm. you know um, there's so many ways you can go with that topic mm -hmm. but um, I give credit because a lot of people are not putting up putting up with it these days mm -hmm. whether you're black white you know whatever, you know, what color or what, what race you are, a lot of people are trying to bridge the gap. Right. Um, you know, you got a lot of interracial couples now, you know, things of that nature. So, um, you know, hats off and just going back to some of the art that I do, mm -hmm. it's just about love. Right. You know, just love. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so many times we feed into different things um, that don't even really matter. You know, but favorite character out of here. Mm -hmm. Ooh. See, I paint a lot of these. Like, when you see some of my paintings, you'll see some of the ladies. But this guy right here, the singer, or ah, uh, it's a it's a between these two right here. Uh, the sax player, yeah, the sax player. yeah, they're getting into it. They got a lot of energy. I just like the dude with the hands is doing that. I oh, just yeah. love that guy. Like, <laughs> I just, 
Get you it. think he the yes. star? Is he the star in the story? I don't know, but that's who I always gravitated to. Like, I just distinctly gravitated to this guy. Yeah. Not the women. You would think it would be one of the women, but I just always, because he's the only one. He is getting it. Yeah. Like, he, yeah, he's in it. What? He is getting it. Yeah. That, I don't know who that guy is, but that's my dude. Well, the way, way his face is, he, right. he, he left him. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so. Yeah, Probably buddy. so. So that's the first one. The second one became famous in the 80s on another television show that was bought by a character at an auction. My bad, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm, dang, Tariq. Okay. The Funeral Procession by Ellis Wilson. Cosby Show. Right. Remember when Claire bought this at auction? Yeah. Um, $11,000. She talked about her Uncle Ellis um, and um, why it was so important. Do you remember? And then she put it, I believe it was, I can't remember if it was over the fireplace or over there but you but it was a staple after that yeah. particular episode um when she auctioned you were probably five when that episode <laughs> came on but those of us who are older remember when uh claire huxtable bought this particular painting and why it was so important to yeah. her um and that his pieces when i was doing some more research on him he is, is as incredible as they are they were i mean he was selling them for hundreds like and right. they're worth tens of thousands um, now. And what I like about it, even though you would see it all the time in the shows, even if, I bet when you go back, you're going to look at an old Cosby oh, yeah. show episode, but even for it being a funeral possession, procession, mm -hmm. you have half the people are in white, which I always thought was fascinating. Yeah. And not everybody is in dark colors. I mean, does that mean that they're not mourning? Like, what is it about... Um, white because it normally that can symbolize birth or baptism or anything along or something along those lines what's your take on that again you can tell story with color mm -hmm. that can be a celebration sometimes okay. of a person or passing um you know that may may be some of the um the family members or whoever that person passed mm -hmm. was that passed but i think that just as you know so many different stories, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, passing over into, you know, another life or, right. you know, celebration. Because, you know, when our folk die, mm -hmm. sometimes it's a celebration in there. Right. You know, and we always want to celebrate a person for whoever they were. So I think that kind of just leads to say, hey, I want to make a contrast in this color mm -hmm. to show, show a little bit of, of light and celebration. And um, what I like is that that could be 2019, perhaps in a rural area. Mm -hmm. That could be 1819. Yeah. You know, it doesn't it doesn't have a time stamp on it, if you will, um, as far as the as far as the people or as far as even the dress or any of that. But the color is is so distinct yeah. in terms of black and white. Is it is it death and sadness or is it life everlasting? But see, you know, then, depending then, on how you look at it. You know, as an artist, I could see more messages. Mm -hmm. Because in here, you know, I was always taught never to use pure black. Okay. You know, and if, if you know, if you mix all the colors together, you can get a black. Mm -hmm. So, but I always use close to a, a blue right here. You see mm -hmm. these blues right here? Mm -hmm. Giving a little more color in that, in that, in that black. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Last one before we move on to you. This is one that is by Charlie Palmer, and it's called Speak With Confidence. And I tend to gravitate towards images like that that are really powerful. Yeah. Um, and this isn't an old piece at all, yeah. but very much what we um, have dealt with through generations and obviously our young black men are dealing with now, um, obviously your images of the flag, mm -hmm. um, it being called speak with confidence, but how do you do that under the um, the shadow of this? Yeah. I mean, obviously you have the streaks, the blood, the sadness in the eyes. Yeah. I mean, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. And, you know, this is what I mean in terms of being able to tell our story. Yeah. Because we can talk about police brutality. 
we can talk about racism, we can talk about systemic racism, we can talk about sexism, we can talk about misogyny, all of those things. But for me, specifically as it relates to the, the black experience for the black male, especially the young black male, yeah. having been on the bench and having seen what the school to prison pipeline really looks like yeah. in real time and what it looks like from the bench and being powerless to really be able to help the yeah. way I wanted to help. I just kind of have to give them a black woman look like, you sure you want to do this, you know, <laughs> and hope that they get what I'm saying. Um, verse, and then coming back to the, to the point of where I am now being back in private practice. But had you seen this before? This is actually my first time seeing this. Yeah. What is it? What does it say to you? What it does. I mean, he's, he's overshadowed by uh, America, you know, and, and the, uh, the, you know, part of the broken justice system. Um, it's, it's almost like he wants to speak, but he, he has his mouth closed, you know, and, um, these here are bars, prison bars mm -hmm. to me, um, behind the states. Mm -hmm. Or stars and stripes mm -hmm. or prison bars. Yeah. What about in the back? You can vaguely see, uh. Yeah, I can either see policemen back there. Yeah, and you see the faces, you see the hint of faces. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I almost felt like it was ancestors or, you know, people have come before us. Right. And, and like, I come, got like a real and, civil rights yeah. almost feel. Because when you first look at it, you don't see it. But when you look closer, like there's faces on the end, faces here, even in the middle. So if you want to if you want to go a little deeper, and me reading it as an artist, these are the people that paid the price in blood. Mm. As you can see here, here, and here, and there in red, so this blood is coming down. But they paid the price. They paid the price in blood. And yet, the messages are the title is "Speak with Confidence." And how yeah. do you do that when you have all of that above you and that you're dealing with and have had to deal with and still deal with, and then you're expected, you know, to have a certain ability to speak with with power? I mean, I teach my kids: your voice has power. Your voice has power. But then at the same time, you know, we they I have to understand, you know, what their story is. And it's and oftentimes it is heartbreaking. Right. It's heartbreaking. Right. Because you have the expectation to use your voice, but it's not always that simple when you have all of these other things that are in your environment that are that you're having to deal with. Right. You know. What else do you see? And man, it's it, it's deep. Cause now I'm even seeing the blood, but I see tears in blood. Mm -hmm. So it's all intertwined. This uh, this is a, a a very good and powerful piece. Um, you could just you can get so much from it. I mean the blue. Um, that could be represented by you know the police. Um, and it's not 50 stars, by the way. I counted them just because I was like, is that really 50 stars? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not. But it makes a point yeah. that you, you, you have the imagery of a flag of stars and stripes. But it's not all 50 states represented. Anything else? That's what I see. So let's talk about you. Who is Tariq? Who is Tariq Nick? So you followed the instructions, thank you, sir. <laughs> and I asked you for pictures from childhood Ooh. to adulthood, and Which I'm not using use? them all yet. Right. Ooh. So this is the dun 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 dun. dun. Um, but I, I picked some for a reason. But we, I want people to really know who you are, um, who you are at your core, and what your story has been and where it's going. Yeah. Because you may have, like I said in the very beginning, you took a huge, huge leap of faith. Mm -hmm leaving corporate America behind it to this is your dream. Yeah. And you're doing it full time. But we gonna start with baby Tariq. Ooh. Ain't him cute. <laughs> oh, ain't he cute. Do you remember um have any idea how old you how many months you would have been? No. Yeah, not at all. No. But thank you for sending it because yeah. you know, that is one cute kid. That yeah. really is. Um what is your first memory and this is always really tough, but what is the first thing you actually remember from your childhood? My parents mm -hmm. always uh, working to provide for me and my my siblings. Mm -hmm. um, 
and just giving us the best experience that they could. Right. You know, so down to family time, mm -hmm. trips, vacations, um, down to taking us to school, trying to just show us the right way and keep us on the right path. What about so. this cutie? Oh, <laughs> cute. Yeah. <laughs> now this was still infancy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, are you only child? No. How uh, many brothers and sisters? I have brothers and sisters. I have a brother and a sister that I grew up with, mm -hmm. but I more recently found out about four other brothers and sisters. Oh, that wow. I had, yeah, on my biological father's side. And have you been able to connect with them? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. um, uh, the majority of them, okay. yeah. So. Family picture. Woo, man. Now, that's your brother, your older brother, obviously. No, this is me. Oh, my God, I thought yeah. that was Come you. Come on, like, now. That look just alike. This that's is your my, baby brother. This is my baby brother. Now, I got to tell everybody what I said to you when I first saw this picture. What? Remember I said, dang, it's Big Daddy King. No. <laughs> <laughs> your daddy look like, don't he look like Big Daddy King, though, for real? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure that's something you're not telling me? Yeah. Okay. Nah. nah. That's your stepdad, though, right? I, that's my stepdad. You do look like Big Daddy Kane, yeah. though. I real. told my mom that when yeah. I gave you pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, your younger brother, how um, what's the age difference? Uh, six years. Okay. Yeah, six years. And how would you describe yourself as a big brother? Um, I try to lead the way and be a leader, you know, and um, giving him the best example as I can. Um, and more recently, you know, a lot of times when we're old, we go about, you know, working and working and working and working. So more recently, we kind of reconnected. Um, we talk all the time, but we kind of reconnected to kind of build something, you know, as a family. So um, he's kind of helping me out with um, some behind the scenes business projects and stuff. So uh, I just love it, man. You know, it's, uh, it's important to stick together as a family. That's right. You know? So. What about your the rest of your your mom your mom and stepdad with your brother where are they now? Um, mom is now in South Carolina with me, mm -hmm. and um, my stepdad is in uh, Durham, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. And your brother is is he in South Carolina? Yeah, he's in South Carolina. Yeah. Okay. So. What about this picture? Hey. What was going on here? It looked very official with your tie with the money. Money, on baby. It. What? Hey, so. That <laughs> <laughs> Money, money, now, money. Now, I don't know if you got that picture. I want everybody to remember that picture. Right. Because I don't know if you got that picture with my daughters in it. I do. That's my twin. Okay. My oldest, that's my twin. So okay. you'll see the resemblance. So who is this lady? She's the Parker, mayor. She, she was the mayor of Durham. Oh, okay. Yeah, she was okay. the mayor of Durham. Okay. And I was a uh, part of a program called uh, the Knights at the Round Table. Okay. Uh, which was... Um, uh, part of my high school we were known as northern knights mm -hmm. and so um as part of that program i was able to go meet the mayor and shake her hand was that a big deal oh yeah yeah i mean back then as being the kid and part of being a knights at the round table i had a 3.4 gpa okay which i carried out and ended uh my college you gotta um, tell them with to tell the people yeah. tell yeah, the so. people okay all right and this one how I sent you that you? one? You did. How did you get a hold of that one? <laughs> Woo! Hey, look at that. I, I had a little bit of hair you left there. a little bit of hair. Yeah. Oh, your beard was oh, tight. Oh, I ain't even had no beard. Is that? Yeah, it was tight, though. <laughs> I mean, it was all edged up. Okay. Hey. How old were you? <laughs> Man, let's see. I probably was 28. Oh, wow. 28. You were that. You do not right. look like you were 28, Tariq, in this picture at all. That's I, I guess maybe early 20s, very early 20s. Yeah, yeah, I was probably around. This is one of your pieces. Yes, and what? you can see uh, the abstract nature and the influences now. What was the? What was it that you were depicting? What did you want the the viewer to? What did you want them to feel? So this is, you know, I, a lot of people don't know that I played trumpet for seven years. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you know, in college. Uh, studying the Harlem Renaissance and things of that nature, and just listening to a lot of jazz music, mm -hmm. some of the masters, um, I always study uh, improvisation. Okay. So this was just kind of like capturing a moment of strings, mm -hmm. you know, but just giving it a lot of energy, a lot of movement, 
Um, and again, that those bold lines and, mm -hmm. and color again the faith. Uh, yeah, I think I did. Now, I this, I now, when was your first major piece of art that you feel like that you that you painted? How old were you? I would say uh, nineteen. And so what? So you were you were an athlete? Yeah. And that's where you felt like you were going. So tell us about how that how that happened. How did the transition? happened to art became what your passion was so you know my uh college year college years i was actually um i had a track scholarship and um just trying to make my way you know mm -hmm. i was a business owner in college what, do you, what kind of business everybody knows the, the old great prepaid legal uh, <laughs> but look around. This is what I can say about that. I it, it made me into who I am today, far mm -hmm. as personal development, mm -hmm. um, leadership skills, um, having a, a a team of um, young black individuals who you know guys and right. women who we stood stood together, mm -hmm. and we pretty much shaped our futures. Mm -hmm. You know, um, far as uh, you know mentorship, leadership, and sales skills. Right. You know, but. Um, I had a lot going for myself at the time, and mm -hmm. I really wanted to take track to the next level. Mm -hmm. But we never know how the higher power, you know, how, what what the plan is for Speaks us. On it. So. What was your event or events? Um, I ran the hundred meter dash, two hundred, mm -hmm. uh, four by one, four by two. They got that scholarship money out of me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got you. But uh, while on track scholarship at uh, Penn Relays, um, um. I had a um, heart attack. Oh my god! At 19 years old, so. Oh my god! You uh, just gonna throw that out there and just okay? Yes. Wow. So that's what and and funny thing about that, wow. uh, the people who were in my heat is uh was uh David Oliver was actually on my team, mm. who was a um Olympian, mm -hmm. uh Bron he he won a medal uh in the I think it was Beijing, mm -hmm. uh and Justin Gatlin was in that that heat. Oh wow! So. Uh, but oh run, my yeah, we're running the four by one. Um, oh, Lance Gross was on the team too. So that wow. all those people was on my four by one team. Wow. Lance Gross, David Oliver, me, and uh, Andrew Murphy. Okay. But um, basically, after running my leg, um, my heart went into a fast rhythm, and the doctor said it was 240 heartbeats per minute. Oh which my god! I learned at that time, but. Basically, uh, make a long story short, I just went over to the bullpen, and it's, it's thousands of people there. International, Jamaica is there, mm -hmm. you know, 50,000, 60,000 people there. Uh, so all my team members was like, man, get up, because, you know, back then we were like top condition athletes right. uh, until they knew I wasn't playing. So mm -hmm. basically, um, when, I, when I tell you this story, I tell you it was God. So uh, they came down, they got me, went up through – to uh, get to the ambulance. While get, going up to the ambulance, out of all these thousands of people, a cardiologist walks by. Oh, wow. And he's like, uh, is everything okay? No, this guy's in cardiac arrest. So he gives me, opens up his bag, give me three shots of medicine. Oh, my God, look at God. One, one of those doses was supposed to make my heart rate go down, but it didn't go down. Mm -hmm. uh, got to the ambulance, my stretcher broke down. Mm -hmm. They switched me on stretchers, got in the ambulance, my ambulance mm -hmm. broke down. So wow. I'm waiting in the back of this ambulance for 45 minutes. And and the hospital is actually only two or three blocks down, but because of the traffic, it couldn't get to me. Mm. Heart rate still at 240 heartbeats per minute. Mm. And I finally get to the emergency room, and it's like eight eight people running around me, tearing my shirt off, and they're getting ready to put the defibrillator on me. And I start struggling, and they're like, well, he's still conscious. Mm -hmm. Let's just let him calm down. Mm -hmm. So I went, fell asleep with the medicine they gave me, woke back up, and uh, my coach was there, uh, Coach Merritt, uh, who passed away, uh, God bless his soul. But he um, was sitting there, and the doctor came in. I was like, we didn't think he was going to make it. Mm -hmm. And that's when they told me my heart rate was 240 heartbeats per minute. And I'm like, ready to get back out there and compete. Wow. I'm like, man, when is this going to be over? When can I get back on the track? Mm -hmm. You know, and then my four by one team came in. You know, Lance, Dave, and um, and uh, Andrew, and they came and prayed over me, and 
They flew me back. Well, parents came over, went back to Duke, and that's when I found out that I would never ever be able to run again. Mm. So, but through that, that pain, um, art came. Wow. And that's what got me back to uh, being me. Because you can only imagine mentally what it can do to you at 19 years old. Right. And, you know, the doctor was like, well, maybe you should take some time off from school. But mm -hmm. I still had that fight in me, and I went and finished. I was like, no, I'm going to go back and finish school. So mm -hmm. through that um, that year is when I knew I was going to start taking art serious. That mm -hmm. year I had an art show. That's when I really had to get my spiritual game up. Mm -hmm. You're broken. Right. So when you're broken... And God says, hey, I'm going to break you down now so you can see. Mm. We always go through it. We, some people go through the struggle. They complain. They see it as pain. But if you if you can only just see the bigger picture. Mm. If you're still breathing, it's a bigger picture. That's right. If you're still breathing, you better preach up in here. then yes, you, you you still have a reason for being here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whatever, what, whatever someone's going through, but if you still have breath in your body, you still got a story to tell. You still have a duty to tell your story. That's right. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's my ov overall message with that, you know, and, and being able to come back from that, uh, was, was big for me. But that year, uh, I didn't worry about anything. Now, mm -hmm. this is where the love comes in because the love for art was, was major. Mm -hmm. And with me having that love for art, um, and really just tapping into my spiritual sense and the higher being, um, I wasn't worried about anything. I won't worry about no money. I won't worry about you can't. Right. When you broken down like that and everything you love was taken from you, mm -hmm. you don't love anything at the time. Right. But that one little light and my focus shift mm -hmm. shifted. Um, I had someone speaking to my life and they said people will come to you and, and they will say we're already we're ready to invest. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later I had a show and it sold out. Mm -hmm. As a junior I made six thousand dollars in college. Wow. But guess what? I won't thinking about no money. Right. It was it was the universe putting everything in my path to say, hey, keep going this way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's that that's after that, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it was a wrap. Like I'm still doing art to this day, right. you know, and uh, a lot of times we're hard headed too. Mm -hmm. I should have I should have been gone full time, mm -hmm. you know. True. But with me, uh, every time. Uh, things came and people come they still come to this day and say hey I want to buy that piece right. and sometimes you're still in awe oh you want to buy that for 2500 mm -hmm. I was talking about that to an artist the other day and it was like uh, sometimes we get surprised because so many people are like oh no I'll think about it oh mm -hmm. no but when that one person comes like yeah I'll pay that 5000 mm -hmm. and like yeah I'll pay that 5000 for your art right right <laughs> yeah but yeah that's uh that story in a sense so so talk to us about this piece that was a part of a project that i did um for someone um but when i did the piece i always put my love into it mm -hmm. and i always want the message to come across um i didn't want it to just be a portrait right but as you can see you can see the civil rights movement here mm -hmm. and you see the unity with the lines and how they're in lock mm -hmm. they're locked all the way through here but you got people with different shades of color mm -hmm. you know there's some women in there men women all together and then you still have uh dr king still you know as a leader and of course with him passing away he's still like big the Logical big picture life. right yeah yeah and when did you do this piece how old were you actually i did that piece about three years ago three or four years ago Mm -hmm. Then did you sell it, or do you still have it? I still have it. You're not gonna sell it. It's for sale. Oh, okay. <laughs> we don't come to that. We don't Everything come to that. for sale. <laughs> All right, then. On that note, moving on. What about this piece? That now it's hard to see from the screen, but is there? It looks like there's texture here. Yes. So what's the it is. To like? Explain to us what the medium is. So it's this is acrylic too as well, uh, but um, I've always wanted to do. Um, florals and landscape mm -hmm. but I wanted to do it in my style but this piece was uh for me I wanted to get back because a lot of times as artists we get a lot of commissions mm -hmm. and sometimes we can get balled down mentally mm -hmm. 
because it's like you want to get back to what you want to do. Right. Like being a kid doing your homework, but you want to go outside and play basketball, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we do love doing the commission, but this was me just going back to being a kid, mm -hmm. you know, being free with the work and uh, really in, engaging in lines and, and texture. Um, mm -hmm. And this is actually a pretty large piece, but this one is uh, called Golden Rose. Mm -hmm. um, I really love this piece. About this one. Wow, this was a transition piece for me, mm -hmm. 2014. Okay. Um, you know, this was at a time I, you know, went through a separation and whatnot, but and and just you know, uh, kind of feeling everything and the emotion. I always wanted to do nudes, mm -hmm. but I wanted to represent the black female or females in a sense of power. Mm. So with this piece, it was actually for domestic violence, but a lot of uh, people who collect it, mm -hmm. they collect it for all, they see their own message in it. Okay. But it, it tells a story because through everything, she's uh, clenching the ribbon. That's mm -hmm. for strength. I, I painted that for strength. She's holding herself for self-preservation and care. That's beautiful. And then she's still holding her head high. She's crying through all of it, but she's holding her head high. You know, and uh, the roses are crying in the background. Um, but this piece is large. It's like 68 by 40, uh, pretty big. And I wanted it to tell a, a, a story. It's one of my most powerful pieces. What's it called? It's called Violet Rise. And is this um, available to, like as a print? Yeah. Okay. Oh, the original still. I, I held on to that original. Okay. The original still there. Yeah. That's, that's for sale too. Yeah, it's for sale. <laughs> Everything's for sale. <laughs> what about this one? Because this is one of the signature things that you do, your heartbeat collection. Right. So what was the um, motivation? So my heartbeats, um, I wanted each and each one of my collectors to have uh, something small. Because a lot of my pieces are large. Mm -hmm. So, but with this piece, it um, they're heartbeats. Mm -hmm. So my heart beats on and it... Uh, and I wanted to give a little bit of love, mm -hmm. spread the love around. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of art um, or hearts out there that's, you know, artwork, but mine has a lot of meaning for me. Are all of them unique? Yeah, each one of them are different. Okay. Each one of them, and I have, uh, I'm actually on number 75 now. Wow. So uh, my collectors really um, connect with these. Mm -hmm. I've had some of my collectors, their kids had, you mm -hmm. know, heart surgery at a certain age. Mm -hmm. They put them in their room. Some collectors um, collect them like candy pieces. Mm -hmm. They got about five or six of them around the house. But um, just my way of spreading love uh, in, in a small, smaller way. So, so it's very textured. Like, what's the, the texture here? That's, that's that, a secret. Oh, you're not going to tell us? Yeah, that's a secret. Oh. No, I'm just playing. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's acrylic medium. Okay. All of it is acrylic. So medium. all that's acrylic? Like, has that much texture? Yeah. Get out of here. Let's call it acrylic. Okay. All of it is acrylic. Wow, and that's attached to obviously attached to the canvas. Yeah, yeah. That's dope. Okay, yeah. I just always figure. Okay, this is like paper mache. Like, what is that? Like paper what? mache. I don't even know what that. <laughs> I don't don't mean to be insulted. Like, hey, if I, I said know. that, was, if I said that was paper mache, it'd be a lot of mad collectors right. out there right now. I, I, like, I, hold on, let me I pull this back. See what's up there. <laughs> <laughs> but they <laughs> all are all they are all different, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So my favorite is this picture ah, yeah. and I posted this on my IG because this is when I asked you to do a piece for me yeah and what I said at the time and I just said just do it yeah you know and I wanted a piece because I had um, just become a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and Incorporated mm -hmm. Ooh. Oh. and um, mom was a Delta yeah and um, I'm a legacy and so I just wanted something to show um, our connection because yeah. she's passed away and she couldn't be there. Yeah. Like I, I knew she was there, yeah. but she couldn't be there. And something that symbolized like if she was there, what would it be like yeah. if she was still yeah. here? So you sent me, this is the finished, but I remember when you sent me the first draft. Yeah. And I was like, mm-mm, no, mama's skin don't look like that. Like, I was complaining <laughs> about it because I sent you pictures of her, but I had no idea what you were going to come up with. Like, yeah. not a clue. I didn't give you any direction or any of that. 
And then the second uh, rendering, I don't know if that's the proper term, but the separate second rendering or the, what you showed me mm-hmm. was like the development of that part. Yeah. And then when you showed me like just the picture, I remember a specific, and this is why I think art is so powerful. I was laying in bed, alarm goes off, roll over, go cut the alarm off. And for some reason I go swipe mm-hmm. to see my messages and I see it and I'm just laying in the bed. Oh my God, I was boohoo ugly crying. Oh my God. <laughs> it just took my breath away. Yeah. Like it legitimately took my breath away. And I didn't even, there's things that I still see in it now yeah. that are so much more significant to me that I just, I didn't even catch. I was just so taken aback by just the immediate imagery of, her in white, me in red, the yeah. elephant, um, the feeling of protection, the intertwined arms, all yeah. of that. And so the final piece was this. Yeah. And then, then you picked out the frame yeah. and all of that. And we call I called it. I remember when you had me name it. I was like, I didn't know. It was like, wait, I'm supposed to go <laughs> with a name? Like, I, I, mm-hmm. I assumed that you would. Like, you yeah. would name it. Um, but came up with Destin's legacy. Yeah. So... I remember you telling me there was something about this piece that was there were some new things that you had never painted before, images that you hadn't done yeah. before. So tell us about that. Well, um, that's the one thing that I love about doing artwork for my collective mm-hmm. is they never tell me exactly what they want. Right. So I get to, again we're going back to the story mm-hmm. when we first talked about the story. Right. So um, I'm always motivated to you know go above and beyond, mm-hmm. um, but um, everything has a tell story because I, I did the red or crimson, excuse me. Right. <coughs> excuse crimson, me. sir. Uh, uh, crimson. <laughs> uh, for your color, but again, like we looked at that picture mm-hmm. back when uh, earlier for the show, mm-hmm. um, she's in white. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's again the light um, just representing uh, her passing, but she's um, glowing. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, just that care and in, intertwined care and the power. Now you have power back here and um, stability um, with these two elephants back here. Wow. Um, but I've never painted elephants. Ever? Never. Wow. Never painted elephants. Uh, and the, ben- the bench was an intimate moment, Lee. Mm-hmm. And then you could see that bright light um, shining down on you two guys coming down through here. So. What really struck me was that the, the hats that that was such a big deal because you know I even I didn't even that just didn't even resonate with me until like after you left I was like oh my god because my mother loved loved hats now see that's that that's that universal connection yeah love because I, I would have never known hats, that. all that yeah. hats hats uh, her hat collection was phenomenal yeah. and that was one of the things I wanted to make sure that I had like when I I won't wear a hat unless it's hers yeah there's one in particular that's really powerful for me because like even now i can still and maybe it's in my mind i don't know i still smell her yeah when i put it on uh, i just feel better mm-hmm. you know it's this real simple hat but i was like oh my god yeah how do you know that she loved hats <laughs> you know you could have done anything with that and yeah. just just how you have us um looking at each other but you don't see our eyes you know but there's an unspoken communication there between the two of us um, and I think the only reason why I didn't boohoo ugly cry when you bought it is because I actually had a chance to yeah, see it before. Like if yeah. you would just unveil that in my office, oh. I would have been on the floor. Yeah. Like no, I'm no no bullshit. Oop, yeah. Oh what? Yeah, I can cuss. But no, <laughs> <laughs> I would have been on the floor. Yeah. Like I literally was like laying in the bed just crying, and I didn't even take a good close look at it because it just it really it it. It just took my breath away. Yeah, and yeah. so I thank you for that. And I, when I posted it on social media, particularly on one of the pages for um, SARS, they just loved it. And yeah. like, like, can I? where can I get it? Where can I get it? Where can I get it? Remember, you asked me, it's like, can I? Nope. That's mine. There can never be another. That's a masterpiece. I it put, is. I poured a lot of time into that piece. And it was apparent. And yeah. I've had people ask, are you sure he won't make a print? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> no. They can do something else. You can do something oh, similar. Oh, man. But, yeah, I know I didn't cut your coins, you know, but no, because I, I could, because what that means for me may not okay. mean something for somebody else. Yeah. And that piece will never, ever be um Well, you got a one 
it. You got a one and only. Right. So no, y'all can't have that. But it's it's just beautiful because it really just speaks. It, it speaks to the connection that you know we have when we lose someone that's very close to mm -hmm. us. And with my mom, it was very specific. Both my parents have passed, but it was very specific with her when I went through this went through the process of just feeling sometimes a sense of sadness because I couldn't talk to her and she wasn't there. Yeah. You know, but this just gave me, you know, it just gave me life. And so I thank you for that. So, and you do commission work often. Yes. So yes. they just have to reach out to you. We'll get to that in just a second before we get our painting lesson. Uh -oh. Okay, so last thing, this is in my house and I really wanted to use this piece. It's pencil. And honestly, I have no idea who the artist is. Mm -hmm. It was given to me as a gift from an from an ex and yeah. I got it framed. And it, I when I got it framed it was in my office before I became a judge. Yeah. And it was in the reception area. And I always thought, God, I don't want to offend folk, you know, it might make white people mad. Honestly, I'm just being real talk. Yeah. Because it says there's so much going on here. Yeah. Talking about the justice the just us system the the judge itself how the judge looks so disinterested obviously police officer could be male but obviously it's female yeah you know you got a feet with a noose and then you have young brother who is trying to get away another young brother trying to help him young brother who is with money in his hand pointing at obviously somebody who's already incarcerated and then you've got hands that are are glowing and like who is that person like who does that represent and so it was in my office for years. Yeah. But the, the big question I had to decide was when I became a judge, do I take this piece to my office? And I was like, hell yeah, I'm putting it in my <laughs> office and I want people to see it when they come in. And then I thought about it um, and I had a, I almost had an argument with my cousin. I was like, girl, she was like, don't do it, don't do it. I was like, because I was ready because I yeah. was taking all my other artwork and she was like, no, don't do it, don't do it. I was like, no, I really am because yeah. this is, this is reality. Yeah. This is reality for what I saw as a judge um, on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, and that got for me, and I chose not to. Only reason why I chose not to, because I wanted to remind myself of my own private space. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how this how this image still makes me feel. Right. Because, you know, walking into the courtroom and I see a sea of black face, it literally got to the point to read probably about six months in. I just... You know, I would come in, sit down, and I wouldn't even scan the audience. Normally, I would scan the audience, yeah. just out of human nature. But I just stopped doing that mm. because I felt the depression. Yeah. Like, rarely would you see anybody who didn't look like me. Yeah. Yeah. And then whether it was, or and sometimes worse, if I was in family court, I don't want to go off on a rant, but in family court, you know, if I see, you know, black folks that are representing themselves and they're not in any position to do it effectively because they just don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Um, but this is so incredibly powerful because you would expect that the officer was male, but when you take a look at it again, officer's not, it's a woman with a noose. Right, right, right. Like, right. with a noose, you mm. know what I mean? I mean and then that's the, that's, the, that's the end game. Um, but then you see the help, you see the I don't give a, you know, I, you, I don't give a you know attitude yeah. and try not to cuss too much. It's like first time I cuss on the podcast. <laughs> Um, and then, um, you know, the brother behind him, stereotypical, I don't know, but you see anger, you see, and he's so much larger than everybody else there, but is he really, yeah. you know, like what, what does that mean? Um, and then you see hands that aren't attached to anyone, but then you see, like I said, the glow around it. So don't know the artist, don't know the name, but this is something that I think speaks to what we're dealing with now and it's timeless. Yeah. I mean, this could be, this could be 1800s, it could be 2019 and the, the imagery is still the same. As a black man, what do you see? This has got a hundred messages in it. Cause what I, I, I mean, I see the, the reckoning factor here. Mm -hmm. But with this young boy right here, it, it, he's basically saying, do you want to be like them? Mm -hmm. Kind of giving them a message. Right. And um, when he said, do you want to be like him, them, it's like so many different examples. You know, you got this brother right here. He's like, man, I'm going to pay this money and get out of this. You know, but it's a continuing cycle. Um, but then again, He's, he's he's already seen this, mm -hmm. you know, 
So now he's kind of turning him around to see, hey, do you want to be like everybody else? Now these hands back here, I couldn't tell you what that is. Mm. That's a mystery to me. I always saw it as there's another way. Yeah. But you got to get there. You know, this is where they're leading you, but there's another come way. Come back. Yeah, come back. This that way, you yeah. can, that you, this, is, this doesn't have to be your destiny. Yeah. It doesn't have to be your destiny, but you got to get back there. Um, even if you've gotten to the front of the line with this disinterested white male judge, mm -hmm. there's, still an, there's still an option to get out of it. Yeah. If you, I was a judge. Yeah. It yeah. really did. Like, this kept me in check. And I don't know if I had kept it in my office if it would have had the same effect. Like, I would have really cared less if my white counterparts had an issue with it, mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. um, because this is our reality. Yeah. You know, this is the reality of what we deal with in this in the system that was based um, on systemic racism with a pipeline. That's, oh, I'm going to get on the rant. I'm not going to do that. But, you know, that's the point um, of how art speaks to our experience. Mm -hmm. And we have to have these conversations about, is this real? Is this reality? Yeah. And absolutely it is. So that's one of my favorites. So now we move on to we're gonna we're gonna skip all that because now it's art time. Ooh. Let's get it. So this is where you gonna teach me what we, what you gonna teach me. I don't even know. We need to talk about this, y'all. So whatever's getting ready to happen here on this iPad screen, we just gonna roll with it. Okay. So what we getting ready to do? So this is Sketchpad. So um, am I doing abstract? What am I doing? What's what's going on? What um, doing? I'm gonna let you be creative. So. I don't do that, Tariq. We had there was supposed to be a lesson. Don't do me like that, cause I don't know what I'm. What are we doing? So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's how I create art. So we okay. just talked about it, right? Oh, God, it's just too much. But I want you to be able to to uh, tell a story in your own way. Right, but okay. So uh, let's see here. Tell me what to draw, I'm going to draw it, and I'm going to be good at it. <laughs> Let's see here, what can we do here? So, uh, what's something that you would like to draw? That's not a lesson to read. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to draw a figure? I you want to do a landscape? I, I, I want to do something abstract, because you, you do contemporary work. Yeah, so I, I do abstract do something work. Else. Yeah. So, I mean, I could, this is a pretty intricate program here. Let me see if I can get this thing working here. Oh, your pen's not on. See, I'm the, I'm the yeah. step back. Okay, now that's better. Okay. There we go. All right, All and right. then we go back that way. And then we got your, your famous color in here. Of course. So, all right, so I want you to draw what it means to be Delta. But we the first thing, first thing, the paint out the, gate. the okay, first thing, first we, all, first, I can't, use that. I can't use this brush. Yeah, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an outline sketch first, okay? Okay. And we used to do what's called a quick sketch. So I'm gonna go over here, mm -hmm. grab a darker color, and then that's way too thick. Okay. Let me see. We're gonna go in here. That's the flow. There we go. So a quick sketch is gonna be something like this. A lot of pressure. I thought you were gonna like walk me through. Yeah, I'm gonna walk you through it. Teach me something. But we're I gonna, gotta just draw this on my own. Yeah, we're gonna do a quick sketch. Okay. What in the world? And then we'll um, fill it in. So I'm just kind of giving you an idea of what a quick sketch would be. And this is just how I do. Um, cause I really don't. Um, see now, you ever seen that meme with that cake? Which cake? The Delta cake. No. You ever seen? <laughs> Oh, when she's all raggedy and leaning to the side. Abomination. Forgive, all forgive me. <laughs> forgive me, but this is a quick sketch. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, that is all not. Right, so, okay. so, yeah, I'm ready now. You can, We can go back. Okay, let's get rid of all that. Yeah, yeah. We're going to, yeah. But then we'll go back on top of it with color and stuff like that. Okay. What does it, dang, what does it mean to be a Delta? Hmm. It don't have to be perfect. I mean, hmm. for time's sake. Okay. So she said, "Hurry up!" All right. <laughs> um. Okay. 
they rise or not. Sacred. Now you shall. Start with the basics at the bottom. Okay. Wow, this is really hard with this thing. Okay. Okay, never mind. Remember, remember this is your expression, so if you want to put that and let it just be words, and then we can paint some color in the back, then you can do that too as well. I'm trying to, like, no. if I'm, a, if I'm mid, like, I know uh, it's not, but we gon' you gonna make me feel better about myself. Okay. Okay. Oh, you give me some thoughts on it. Yes, honey. You better give me them tatas. This is my my my. Oh, I can. Okay, that's dope. Okay, so we gonna right. we gonna put some color put in some it. Some layers in there. All right. We gonna color in it because we can't just be naked tie ties. Okay. All right. All right, and so. All right, and then. This would be all brown, or brown, or shin, or the brown. Okay. Let me get there. And we're gonna have to wrap it up. Get back to the this, like, yeah, okay, oh, change color. 
<laughs> hey, start an auction at uh, start bid at a thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> that ain't that bad. It is, but there you, you know, you know, I was going with that. Oh, wait, hold up. Let me do that with the fine. Yeah, um, there yes, it is. sir. There it is. <laughs> we will there take it, it. We will take it. Okay, so starting bid. $12,000. Yep. I take PayPal. It'll be fun. <laughs> All right, so what's coming soon? Because we got to wrap it up, unfortunately. Now, you've been fabulous, fabulous. But what's coming soon? So we know, well, people may not know, you've left corporate yeah. America. You are yeah. out on your own yeah. doing your thing. Yeah. Yes. So uh, basically, um, I have some shows coming oh, up. you can leave it up, Steve. My art is awesome. <laughs> I can keep it moving. Okay. <laughs> Um, actually, I'll be at uh, the Maya Angelou luncheon oh, this, here this weekend. In Charlotte. Yep, in Charlotte. Okay, Oprah, y'all come see him. Yeah, definitely. Oprah is going to be the keynote speaker there. Mm-hmm. Um, I have some show, a big show coming up in the spring. So, mm-hmm. um, follow me on T Mix underscore Art. Mm-hmm. Uh, T Mix underscore Art. T M I X underscore Art okay. uh, on Instagram and T Mix Art on Facebook. That's where I put all my updates. Okay. But I got a lot of shows coming up. Uh, if you haven't been to a dime paint and sip brunch edition, you definitely want to come to that. Okay. Um, What's your website? The website is www.tmixstudios.com. Okay. Um, and uh, man, I got some major pieces coming out. Are you on Facebook? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Just Tariq Mix. Can, are you all followed? Uh, Five thousand. But if you go, oh, okay. if if you you can either hit follow or if you go to T Mix Art, the business page, okay. you can follow me there. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, Steve, can we get back to that screen to my screen for a second? Okay, so very quickly, the Sue mm-hmm. part is where I ask very specific questions. Can't think about it. Go. Mm-hmm. If you had to be shipwrecked on a deserted island, island, but all of your human needs, food and water, were taken care of, what two items would you want to have with you? Two items. Two items. You can food, water. You're good. Uh, what two items? I need, need to have a woman. A kind of part. Okay. I ain't <laughs> hey, right. Hey, and then all the other items I need is right there on that woman. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can make <Okay>. it work. <laughs> just a woman. Yeah, just a woman. That's uh, all. Okay. Uh, oh, and my, my paintbrushes and canvas. Okay. Yeah, I got to have that. All right. Paintbrushes and canvas. All right. Um, what do you do when a baby just stares at you in public? Uh, I'm a baby whisperer. Okay. I have three daughters, so okay. I love kids. Every every kid I come across, I speak to them. Okay. And, um, you know, even when I was working in corporate America, some of the kids would come back and say my name, and the parents would be, mm-hmm. you know, uh, surprised. But I love kids. And you have three daughters. Yeah. I thought I had that picture in here. And how old are they? Uh, uh, we're about to have a 13-year-old mm-hmm. and 10 and 9. Okay. All yep. daddy's girls. Yep. Mm-hmm. Of course. All right. What is the funniest thing that you've witnessed recently? Ooh, funniest thing I've witnessed recently? Oh, I look at funny stuff on Instagram all day long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, like live, like not in, not on social media. Live? Yeah. Oh, man. I saw this woman fall. No, we can't do that. Um, no, I, I got to tell it. And it was, <laughs> it was after our board retreat, Travis, if he's watching. We were leaving. And it was so, it was shocking. It wasn't funny at the time because yeah. when she fell, it was like, I've never seen a person fall in slow motion and that dramatically because we didn't know what she was falling Ooh. over. She was just walking and it was just contorted and oh That's my bad. God. And it like, she came out of her, <laughs> she Ooh. came out of her shoe and everybody was like, <gasps> like yeah. I, everybody was like, oh my God. Like it almost looked like somebody pushed her like invisible. So y'all made sure she was fine yeah, first so before you started I, laughing, right? Right. So like, we were like. <laughs> Oh my God! And then we all walk over there. Are you okay? She's like, Oh, I'm just embarrassed. And we were like, Yeah, because what did she fall over? She's yeah. just walking. Like, yeah. there was <laughs> man. And we got down the street, and it was just like I've never seen anything like that. You know how you see people fall like yeah. you know dramatically, but 
it was dramatic. Okay, we got to move on. All right. Um, if you were a Marvel or DC Comics character, who would you be and why? Ooh. Um, damn. Let's see. Uh, Wolverine. Why? Wolverine, he a beast. He is? Yeah, when he, when he get at it, he get at it. Okay. Ain't no playing. It's go and time. And he regenerates. Oh, yeah. He, then he's good. Yeah. Yeah, he ain't never had hurt, no woman, though. Hurt like hell, though. He ain't really have a woman. He got them really. claws. So he ain't really have a woman. Well, I don't know how, how right. much we can get deeper. Okay, we're not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. We're going to roll with that. And if you could choose one song to play every time you walk into a room for the rest of your life, what would it be? Ooh, dang, so many of them. One. Oh. I couldn't even tell you that, man. No, you got to get me stuck on that one. Uh, one song. Ooh, my mind is going crazy right now. <laughs> uh, What's your probably day? a Jay Z song. Okay. I'm trying to think of which one from his first album. Uh, Presidents to represent me. Okay. That that 